have two mics. <laughs> it's the first. <laughs> um, this is a, an image from the Zendo project at Burning Man in 2012. And for those of you who have not heard about it, uh, we provide help for people on the playa who are experiencing challenging drug experiences. And the experiences I've had at the Zendo Project, both at Burning Man and Africa Burn, and the ones I've had at Johns Hopkins, part of the research program, I'm no longer at Hopkins. Um, I'm living up in Connecticut on the farm. None of those experiences compare to what I've been doing for the last four months, which is taking care of an infant, my first daughter. <laughs> And that she's the reason why I wasn't able to attend the rest of the day, because she's the boss and she dictates my entire life. <laughs> um, so I apologize for, I regret not being able to attend today. Um, I'd like to begin by calling to my mind, and for those of you who recognize some of these faces, these are people who have affected me in a very positive or sometimes difficult way as spiritual teachers. And, um, before I begin, I'd like each of you to kind of think about the people who've affected you. And these are the people that we usually think about when we think about our most important life experiences. Um, sometimes our most important life experiences happen out of the ordinary. They're usually not when we're at work or at home, but sometimes when we're traveling, and that traveling can take place in the interior of our minds or it can take place in places like this, which was in Nepal. And I'd like you to think about the single most important or meaningful life experience you've ever had. And for some people that kind of immediately comes to mind, it's very obvious. Sometimes people say the birth of their first child, the death of a close family member. Um, it could be a traveling experience, a pilgrimage. What's really amazing about what we have found in the research program at Johns Hopkins is that people say that sitting in this small room in the left-hand corner here on a couch with eye shades and headphones with two very kind, compassionate therapists for about six hours is often the single most important, personally meaningful experience of their entire life. And the really cool thing about this room is that this plus a high dose of synthetic psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, uh, this room brings to mind all of the people and all of the places and all of the other experiences people have had. So it's kind of like this fractal experience of meaning. And this room exists because of kind of two threads of previous history. One is in this upper left corner, this is Gordon Wasson, who was a banker from New York who went down to Mexico, and Maria Sabina, who is a healer and shaman, agreed to let him participate in the mushroom ritual. Um, another thread of history is uh, in the upper right, the, um, the Good Friday Experiment. Walter Pankey and colleagues at Harvard Medical School gave a bunch of theology students a high dose of mushrooms, of, synth of psilocybin, and they ended up having these profound experiences, and it was on during a Good Friday service. So kind of those two threads of history come together at Hopkins in this little room, and to date, almost 250 people have participated in a psilocybin session in that room. And what we seem to find, 70% of people have a mystical experience, and we can kind of debate what a mystical experience is, but this was a volunteer's description of a mystical experience that he had on what turned out to be a high-dose experience. So you can read for yourself, and the words that I've kind of bolded in red are qualities that we try to quantify through questionnaires, and the science is, is limited in the way that we can't really quantify what people have experienced, in, especially when it's such a profound thing. But his description kind of captures the, ca the categories of experience that we're looking for. And as I said, 70% of people have an experience like this, and it goes on to affect them very positively afterward. These could be healthy people, and we're also doing studies with cancer patients and people who are lifelong smokers. So for those of you who could kind of bring to mind a top five or single most, maybe you have a couple experiences that stand out. Uh, I'm not sure if it seems weird to you that with such reliability we can give a chemical in a lab and have someone have one of those experiences. 
And I'm not gonna ask you to out yourselves, but for those of you who've had a high dose mushroom experience, maybe it's not so strange. Um, what we're trying to do now is kind of bring these findings more into the mainstream and trying to reach out to people well beyond the psychedelic community who, um, I know that some people kind of joke that the findings that come out of Hopkins and NYU and UCLA are kind of the most obvious research findings you could, you could imagine if you've already had an experience yourself. But for the mainstream medical community, uh, for mainstream America, the larger world community, that's still kind of, a, in, brings up these like strange notions of people really tripping out and um, some kind of bad outcomes from, especially the obsession with LSD in the 60s and the early 70s. The work that I focused on when I was at Hopkins was looking at changes in personality, which um, in psychology, they're kind of ways of describing how people tend to be over time. And there are five domains of personality, and these are domains in which people are not expected to change once you're an adult. So about the age of 30, your personality becomes stable, and it's not expected to move around that much. Um, when I arrived at Johns Hopkins as a postdoc researcher in 2009, I was fascinated by how people could change on measures that are not supposed to change. So my previous research was on intensive meditation training. And we were able to show that after three months, people improved on a domain of concentration that for decades in psychology research, it was assumed <coughs> no one could really improve at this kind of task. So I looked at personality from before to after the high dose experience. And what I found was that personality generally stayed the same. But openness, which is a domain related to fantasy, imagination, appreciation of art and music, openness to feelings, a broad, open-minded tolerance of others' ideas. And it also predicts where people fall in conservative or liberal social ideas. So this domain increased. Every single aspect of the domain increased. And it seemed to track with that kind of experience that I was describing earlier that 70% of people had this mystical experience, life-changing experience, and those are the people who increased in openness. The openness stayed high well after the session was over, well after the drug effects had resolved, and up to a year later, everyone was still reporting that it was an important experience in their life, and on these measures that are not supposed to change once you're an adult, they were still showing elevated levels of openness. Um, as just kind of a side note, we ended up publishing this paper in a standard psychopharmacology journal. And when I submitted to a psychology journal, they refused to review it because the edit editor said that the results were unbelievable. So that goes to show you how much this kind of goes against even, you, I kind of expect that psychologists tend to be more liberal than uh, the mainstream, but even psychologists, um, a very well-respected editor was not willing to review uh, a drug study as a life-changing event. Uh, so openness on a questionnaire measure is interesting and it is certainly groundbreaking in the sense that no one has shown a change like this, especially in healthy adults. Um, but kind of what else is it related to? What I would love to see in the psych psychedelic research is a move toward defining objective measures of improvement for people who've gone through an experience. So rather than just self-report, which is the best we have now, and asking their friends and family members how they've done uh, after the experience, seeing on objective measures of things like creativity and uh, kind of real world performance how people seem to change after an experience. Um, I think there was a study uh, by a meditation researcher who taught people compassion meditation and then uh, in a kind of surreptitious way, went to see if the people who'd been taught compassion meditation were more willing to give up their seat for someone who needed it. And they were more likely, but it was still only something like 30% versus like 0%. <laughs> um, so we have a long ways to go, and I would love to see uh, both the psychedelic research and the contemplative research kind of join forces and see if we can really push people toward being more compassionate and open-hearted. Um, there's another kind of little interesting anecdote I, ha I always share here, because people always say, well, you know, okay, you're more open, but does that really improve your life? And there was a study in Australia that basically linked people who are one standard deviation higher in openness than average. Uh, it was equivalent to a $60,000 increase in annual income in terms of life satisfaction. 
So openness is a real improvement. Um, and there's a current paper under review. The group at Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies has been doing work with MDMA for people with chronic trauma. And the people who showed improvements in their PTSD symptoms or even cured from PTSD showed increases in openness that correlated with those improvements. And this paper is again under review. They've had a, they've had a similar challenge actually getting it published because these results kind of go in the face of what is expected. The, the idea is that someone can improve in terms of symptoms, but they're not supposed to change as a person. Um, and that's kind of an open question, you know, how much does a person really change after an experience like this? The picture that I showed from Nepal, I could say that the person I was when I arrived was not the person that came home from that in Nepal experience. And I think something similar can happen for some people on psilocybin. I'm also fascinated by the neurobiology underlying these changes in openness. Um, Kind of either way, it would be an interesting finding. If someone is claiming that they're more open, they're showing changes on measures that aren't supposed to change, and it's simply a psychological effect. But even more interesting to me would be changes in the brain that support this change in openness, suggesting that psilocybin is actually rewiring the nervous system to be more open, which has its kind of pros and cons. Um, Extreme openness in people who are very vulnerable can be related to some types of kind of instable mental conditions. Uh, but in general, most people are starting out closer to average, so increases in openness, I think, are healthy. Um, what I've kind of, it's a little bit too much to go into right now, but psilocybin acts like serotonin in the brain. It's a very simple kind of explanation of what it does. And it increases certain types of chemicals downstream. So you have an increase in serotonin, and you have things like increases in glutamate downstream that cause neurogenesis, new neurons and synapses growing. Most of this work has been done in rats. And it would be difficult to do this research in humans, but I think we're going to get there. And honestly, when we eventually show changes in neural growth with application of psilocybin, I think that's when most in the medical community will actually kind of turn their heads and say, oh, maybe this is something we should consider. Now, related to, ah, better be careful with these things. Um, related to meditation, which is kind of where, um, where I began in this field and now where I continue, uh, there has been some research suggesting a convergence between findings from the contemplative research and from the psychedelic research. Um, I'll draw your attention to, so at the top here, uh, Dr. Carhart Harris and colleagues in London showed decreases in nodes in the brain that are related to self-processing, so self-referential processing, how you uh, relate your identity as a permanent thing in time and space. And there were reductions in blood flow in those two nodes, in blue and red there, while someone was on a high dose of psilocybin versus when they were not on psilocybin at almost the exact same time that that paper was published, and unbeknownst to them, uh, another friend and colleague, Judd Brewer at Yale, published the one in the middle here at the bottom that showed almost the exact same reductions in blood flow, almost the exact same regions of interest. And because I knew both sets of researchers, I kind of reached out to them and I said, you know, your images almost look like copies of each other. You should compare notes. And what the people that Judd was looking at, Dr. Brewer down at the bottom, these were people with tens of thousands of hours of meditation experience. And this result came from them practicing meditation versus a control condition. So compare that to totally naive participants having a single intravenous high dose psilocybin experience compared to control. And that's basically the same result. Of course, changes in blood flow don't mean that the experience is the same. And I actually know one person who was in, a meditator who was in the study, and he said that the effects of psilocybin were by far more profound than, any, than anything he'd ever experienced in meditation. This is an image that I took on the same trip in Nepal, and I think, looking at it, this looks pretty psychedelic to me. I think it's also interesting that this fellow in the middle here does not look like he's from Nepal, he looks like he's from the Amazon. Um, so I saw a number of things like this during my travels, and it got me thinking that kind of one of two things. Either we have 
ignored the kind of more psychedelic qualities of contemplative practice in the West because it kind of pushes people into that kind of unfamiliar, strange territory similar to the drugs. Or perhaps, especially the Tibetans, maybe there is esoteric kind of mystery cult of substance use that has now been kind of lost to the ages. And either way, I think it's fascinating that phenomenologically there might be more overlap than we kind of think about in the West. And that the, the effects that we think that we're scared of when we talk about psychedelics, um, they may be just as possible as people start meditating more and doing retreats and kind of intensively throwing themselves into their own minds. Um, I can speak personally from a, an experience I had simply paying attention to my breath. Um, it was an experience that almost directly matches what people describe of this kind of unhindered energy of the void. And it was disruptive and unexpected and it happened simply by sitting out in nature in front of a waterfall. So be careful. <laughs> These experiences can happen even when you're not ready for them. Uh, the, the ongoing research at Hopkins uh, is involved with long-term meditators taking psilocybin for the first time. Uh, before I departed uh, my position there, I had the uh, privilege of sitting with a woman who was 70 years old and had been on almost continuous retreat uh, for about 30 years. She was running a, a Zen center, so she was kind of working in the Zen world and doing retreats every month. And she said that her experience, this is not her experience, this is another volunteer, she said her experience with psilocybin was, um, was like technicolor, whereas Zen kind of showed her the, the space of kind of silence and nothingness, but that they were compatible. She also said that in the days afterward, there was a loving kindness that permeated the world, including the chairs in her hotel room and every single thing that she saw and experienced afterward that did not uh, compare to anything she'd ever experienced after a retreat. This was a woman with lots and lots of experience. So the studies ongoing at Hopkins, it's really exciting. Um, this was from a, an indiv individual who had um, not taken psilocybin before and had not meditated before. So after learning meditation for about a month, and then during his psilocybin experience, he started the practice that he had learned. And as you can see, kind of brought him into that similar space of everything being all together now and in the present moment. The way I like to kind of think about both meditation and psychedelics is uh, summed up in a mantra that we actually teach people at Hopkins. It's called trust, let go, be open. And I'm not really sure who came up with this phrase. I'm going to attribute it to Bill Richards who is the head guide at, in the Hopkins program and was part of the original psychedelic research done in Maryland uh, back in the early 70s. And what I like to think about is trust is this uh, agreement to surrender and an open-hearted um, appreciation of how scary existence feels, but also how wonderful it can feel to trust yourself in letting go. The letting go part is allowing yourself to let go of your ideas and conceptions about how the experience should go or what your mind is actually like and seeing yourself potentially for the first time and being open to whatever arises. One of the key suggestions that we give people before, during, and even after during integration is to accept every single aspect of their experience as what is supposed to be happening, whether it's really painful or scary, or it feels like it's not the point. Um, one person, I, it, it wasn't a, someone that I sat with, but he commented that he spent the entire session wondering when the drug effect was gonna kick in. And all of a sudden, two thirds of the way through, he realized that that was his experience and it was happening and he was missing it. But basically, he just needed to tune in. Um, so my real heart lies in what I hope to be a very strong future in this line of research, which is working with people who are dying. Um, the cancer studies that are ongoing and recently completed at, so recently completed at NYU and Hopkins with people with, uh, with cancer diagnosis don't necessarily uh, were, they're not necessarily people who are actively dying. So you could have a terminal diagnosis, you could simply have a cancer diagnosis, be in remission but are scared about the pain or kind of continued surgeries or maybe the cancer coming back. Um, what I feel like is kind of on the horizon is working actively with people uh, who are about to die, um, ideally with enough time before their death so that they can integrate and, uh, in, and interact with their families. 
um, before the moment comes. Um, the reason that psilocybin might be great for this is, um, so while I was guiding sessions, I noticed that a lot of these young people who I was sitting with were talking about feeling like they had died and that that was a good thing, that it had kind of relieved some anxieties for them. Um, except for one person who, it was definitely not a good thing, but it made him even happier to be alive afterwards. So either way, it kind of worked out. Um, and so I was kind of surprised by that finding, and I went back through and looked across all of the studies that had been done up until that point. And it turned out about a third of volunteers reported that they had had a profound experience of their own death during the high-dose session. Um, you can imagine how important that might be for someone who is dealing with anxiety about what's coming next, how do I live the rest of my life knowing that I only have a month or six months or who knows how long left. And looking at the whole lifespan, I've experienced death in my family within the last two years. I experienced childbirth for the first time and kind of everything in between. And those experiences have taught me that it's a little unfortunate, but I feel like most of us live in a little bit in fear of a full life and we make safe choices and we stay with jobs that aren't totally making us happy but feel important or that they're serving others. Um, when my sister was dying of cancer at 29, she really only had two days of the two weeks she had in the hospital to, to, as a reckoning of her life. And this was because she held on until that very last moment. I would like for other people like her, especially young people, to have more than two days with their families, to look across their whole life and to die not in fear or in pain, but with a feeling of how lucky they had, they were to have even 29 years or however long they had, and for death to be an opportunity for liberation, which the Buddhists have talked about for a long time. And now I think in the Western world, with modern medicine, with the research, especially into psychedelics, we have the opportunity to allow more people forget about whether you've meditated your whole life. Everyone gets to die. And maybe that opportunity can be an opportunity for liberation for every single person. Um, I'd also like to plug a really great program that we just started here in New York City called the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program through the Center for Optimal Living. The website is psychedelicprogram.com and we'll be offering drop-in groups monthly starting, the first one is uh, Thursday, December 3rd and we'll hopefully have a very short presentation in the beginning and then most of the group will be um, sharing and discussion and facilitated uh, question and answers for people who are curious to learn more about psychedelics um, or maybe thinking about trying psychedelics but want to make an informed decision about the benefits and potential risks, uh, want to learn more about the research, um, maybe they've read something in the press that makes psilocybin or MDMA sound way too good to be true, so this is a place where hopefully people can get the real facts. And we're also providing therapy and in groups and individual therapy for people who've had psychedelic experiences and are struggling in the aftermath, whether it's good or bad. What we found, especially in the research, is that people really benefit from um, supportive therapy in the days, weeks, months after an experience. And my hope is that this program will allow people to make the best decisions possible about um, what is actually a very powerful and potentially risky endeavor and that especially if they've already had an experience that maybe through the therapy and the group work they don't have to kind of keep going back to the psychedelic experience to find what they think they're looking for that my hope is that it kind of points people more toward directly into their lives and into the world around them um, and that psychedelics are something that are used with care and only when needed and in a safe, supportive setting. And so that concludes my talk. These are at least some of the people. There are many more people who contri contributed to the research. Um, it was my honor to be a part of it for the time I was. And thank you for your attention. Um, right, so the high dose that we were working with at Hopkins was, 
it wasn't arbitrary, but it was kind of chosen as the safest high dose across a few studies that had been done before. And that was 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram, which is about the equivalent of five to six grams of dried psilocybin mushrooms. Um, 30 milligrams works, quote, the best for producing profound effects, but it also um, dramatically increases the risk of bad trips. And even if it's only five minutes of distress and pain and paranoia, that five minutes can feel like an eternity. So what we found is that 20 milligrams, it kind of like backing off the high dose, worked the best for kind of maximizing the benefits and reducing these kind of bad trips. Um, some people benefit a lot from, we've studied lower doses, like 10 milligrams. Most people can't detect five milligrams. Um, but it really depends on the person. Uh, I think a really kind of fascinating line of research ongoing right now in a couple places, mostly with LSD, is microdose studies. Um, I'm curious about it because I just don't know if it's placebo, if there's actually something going on. And I think most people who have tried microdosing themselves, you know, the effects are so minimal as to be, it could just be, I mean, placebo is a very strong effect, but we, if you're going to be kind of playing around with a Schedule One drug, you'd better know that there's a real effect, not, you know, just, I could be drinking a glass of water and have the same result. Um, so Oh, for sure. So there may be slow changes over time in the brain, in the nervous system. Oh, sorry. The question was, could there be changes in the serotonin glutamate system over time if you're doing microdosing in a kind of controlled way? And so I was kind of differentiating. The psychological effects might be minimal or non-existent, but there may be actual really change, really real changes in the nervous system. Um, so the reason that we looked at high dose was to target that kind of mystical experience, which had been shown to have all sorts of long-term positive benefits. Um, and, and I don't mean this in kind of a um, negative way, but I think the, the folks running the program at Hopkins, that was kind of their bent, is looking at this mystical experience. It's certainly not the end-all and be-all of the future, I think, of psilocybin as a medicine. Um, and all sorts of different doses could work for different conditions. Yeah, so, so the setting is, um, there is a soundtrack. It's been used pretty much since the research started in the early 70s. It was developed by this woman, Helen Bonney, who was trying to come up with um, a non-drug music experience that would mimic the effects of psilocybin and LSD. And I guess what we've found is that people have a really great time on the kind of what turned out to be the placebo days, but by far the psilocybin days are much more effective. Um, so the, the music is standard across everyone, and you listen to the same soundtrack each time. Um, yeah. So it's classical music, opera music. I remember when I first listened to it, it kind of sounded a little churchy to me. It felt like being in church. It was a little, it felt religious and kind of a little intense and a little bit haunting. Um, but then some of the other tracks are more kind of like Indian chanting and, um, and world music, for lack of a better term. Yep. Um, I was wondering what um, species of psilocybin mushrooms you're using? Oh, okay, so that's a really good question. We were actually not using mushrooms at all. Uh, David Nichols was a chemist who synthesized all of the psilocybin that has been used in the research to date, um, at Hopkins at least. Um, and I thank you for asking that question because I'm curious, especially given our last speaker, about mushrooms and if we can get the results that we found with just synthetic psilocybin that has been created in a laboratory, um, what more could we find if we use the actual full mushroom body? Um, I believe the mushroom that Gordon Wasson brought back that was used to first synthesize psilocybin was Psilocybe cubensis. Or it might have been, yeah, okay, I'm getting a nod. Um, but of course there are lots of different kinds and some are way more potent than others and have various chemicals other than psilocybin in them. I just have one other question, if you don't mind this. I, you just mentioned that when you were meditating by a waterfall you had an experience that was unwelcome, but it was sort of revelatory in a way. And I guess I, I was wondering what you mean by un, unwelcome, <laughs> that, that it was disruptive. I guess. Right. Um, what I mean is that I was at an academic conference, 
and it was like mid-morning and the talks were going on and I was just taking like a little walk. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like one thing if you're planning a whole weekend, you know, out in nature, but I literally was just taking a break. And so when I sat down and had this experience, um, I still don't know what to say about it. It's almost gone from my memory, except I've told the story a few times. The one time I shared it with a Zen teacher, she confirmed that it was kind of a true experience of emptiness, whatever that means, but she, at least she recognized how I described it. Um, but it was terrifying because it felt all of a sudden that I not only didn't exist, but nothing did. And the only thing that was at the heart of the universe was this kind of unhindered energy that didn't really care about humans or biological life or any of the concerns we have. And some people could experience that and have it be really freeing and even blissful. But for me, it was unexpected, terrifying. And when I came back in my body, I was like, all right, this is the place to be, in a body, on earth, like super excited about this. And then going back to the conference was a little challenging. Okay. Uh, it's not available. I think it probably will be one day, but for now it's kind of part of the research and and also there's copyright on all the on all the songs. So, okay, I'm being cancelled. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff.